This presentation is our current thoughts on the management of specifically jumping the nerve gap. I'm going to talk about conduits, acellularized nerve allograft or ANA, allografts, fresh allografts, cadaver allografts, donor related allografts, and of course the gold standard autograft. In summary, our thought is that the conduit is inferior to an acellularized nerve allograft and that with FK506, a fresh allograft, either cadaver or donor related, can give results equal to an autograft because of the effects of enhancing nerve regeneration of FK506. The combined literature evaluating clinical cases with nerve conduits would suggest that they are successful as an alternative to a nerve repair or a nerve autograft for small diameter, short gap injuries. The vast majority of publications are in digital nerves, and in those situations they are satisfactory to use as an alternative to a nerve autograft. There have been just a very few number of large diameter nerves that have been uh, reported, and it's actually difficult to parse out the results of the regeneration across these large diameter nerves in these 18 or so that have been uh, published. And recently there was an excellent article that suggested that for these conduits, a short distance of less than half a centimeter in large diameter nerves was appropriate. And the results in, those, in that clinical study was similar to a nerve repair. As we see results in these small diameter nerves being successful, the normal tendency of surgeons is going to be to push the use of these conduits to larger diameter, larger gaps. This very simple uh, and, and true uh, equation of volume equal, equaling pi r square suggests that if volume and concentrate, concentration, for example, of trophic factors is important, then the distance that the nerve gap needs to be sh um, shortened or reduced to is very um, profound with respect to increasing the uh, diameter of that graft. Our recent work on Schwann cell senescence, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes, would also suggest that as you increase the volume, it's not just trophic factors in general that would decrease concentration but also the Schwann cells in that conduit would have to work extra hard and over-proliferate in order to um, help the nerves to regenerate. And there may be a setup in these situations for uh, senescence. That's yet to be proven, of course. If we look at the nerve conduits that are available for clinical use, and you look at the purple line and the pink line, you can see that they're available at lengths up to four centimeters and at diameters up to one centimeter. So four centimeter length for a one diameter nerve, that's a large diameter, large volume nerve uh, situation. We have a collection, uh, probably now a dozen, of large diameter uh, nerves that have been reconstructed with conduits that have failed. So we're collecting this little group, uh, and, and pretty soon we'll have a greater number of these failures that then have been um, uh, published for successes at these lengths. So this length is a uh, four centimeter. Uh, two collagen conduits were sutured together to reconstruct this ulnar nerve. And Dan Hunter's done the histology for us. And you can see proximal through the area of the uh, conduit placement and then distally with really no regeneration, making it through that four centimeter length, uh, large diameter nerve. What about acellular nerve allografts? We've been fortunate to have this nerve substitute for a number of years now. It's available um, in these uh, lengths. You can order up to seven centimeters in length. Our laboratory has studied the um, lengths and diameters highlighted here in yellow. In the first study that we did, it was um, short um, distances of 14 and 28 millimeters and here you can see what the acellularized nerve graft looks like 
On the left panel is just cold preservation. This would be put the nerve in some UW solution and put it in the refrigerator. And uh, you can see this uh, uh, laminin stain showing the nice endonurial tubes. And then on the uh, right-hand side, the um, Advance uh, product. So this is just looking in the graft, not across the reconstruction, but in the graft at six weeks. So this is an early study. And the study was set up uh, to evaluate conduit, acellularized nerve allograft provided to our laboratory by oxygen company, and um, the isograft in an animal, an isograft is the same as an autograft. We get it from an identical twin um, uh, rodent. And you can see that when we have the shorter distance, 14 millimeters, uh, as compared to the longer graft, 28 millimeters, that the number of nerve fibers getting to the midpoint of the graft, going from conduit, acellularized nerve, allograft, to isograft, goes from 1,500 to about 5,500 to 13,000. If we push that length of graft out longer, so we've doubled the length from 14 to 28, then you can see in the conduit situation, that's stressing the system. That's fatiguing those axons. You only have 300 axons hitting the mid-graft mid at six weeks with that almost three centimeter graft. By contrast, both the acellularized nerve allograft and the isograft are maintaining the number of fibers that can make it to the uh, mid-graft and Again, the ANA, or acellularized nerve allograft, is not as robust in supporting the regeneration as the gold standard isograft. Now you can see on the right-hand side that we're looking at 22 weeks, not just the six weeks, and we're looking at distal counts now. At least we can provide the uh, mid-graft and distal counts. So if you look over on those bars on the extreme right of this slide, you can see that the number of nerve fibers in the isograft is about 10,000, making it to the distal uh, part of the nerve reconstruction, actually into the recipient nerve, and on the uh, ANA, less, and then not many at all, making it into the um, distal conduit across that um, graft at 22 weeks. Now looking at the longer um, structures of the ANAs, we looked at four centimeters and uh, six centimeters. And you can see in that little drawing or little cartoon uh, below and the lower left, this was our model. We took two nerves and sewed them together in order to get a six centimeter rat graft. Of course, we don't have huge grafts, so we took three and three and sewed it together. And for the four centimeters, we had a suture repair in the midline. We've recently looked at the effect of that suture repair, and it really doesn't make any difference when we're looking at these uh, short gap distances. So if you can see here, we have the green fluorescing uh, rats that um, allow us to look with fluorescent imaging at the axons, uh, which are labeled in green as they cross the graft. And on the left-hand side, isograft, which is similar to autograft, and on the right-hand side, the ANA or acellularized nerve graft. So you see at two centimeters, there's robust regeneration across the isoautograft as well as the ANA. Looks good. At four centimeters, robust regeneration across the isograft, but if you look over onto the right-hand side, it's not regenerating across the ANA. In fact, it's not regenerating even the two centimeters plus that it did um, when we just had a two centimeter graft. Once we stretch that isograft out to six centimeters and here we're only at 10 weeks but you can see that it struggles it doesn't go as robustly in the isograft um, as it does in the four centimeter isograft so something's happening to that regenerating axonal front even in the isograft and if we look over on the right hand side to the ANA again it's blunted it's almost as though it's getting a pushback something stopping the regenerating front on that uh, six centimeter ANA. Our laboratory has been very interested in what is going on here. Why that axon front stops when we increase the length of the ANA and to some degree when we increase the length of the autograft. So we've been studying that and one of the things we've been looking at is Schwann cell senescence. There's been a lot of work done of course in 
cellular senescence, especially fibroblast senescence, senescing fibroblasts are a setup for um, actually development of oncological problems. But cellular growth arrest in response to overproliferation or to stress, especially oxidative uh, stress. Our laboratory has transgenics that allow us to image and label Schwann cells in green and axons in blue. And you can see that when we're just looking at this type of modeling, the Schwann cells cross that gap before the axons do. So if you look at that middle panel on the left-hand side, those are green Schwann cells. They're right across the whole gap. They've come from proximal and distal. And if you look at the panel above at five days, on the left-hand side, you can see there's more proliferation coming from the distal end by those Schwann cells even than proximally. But once the axons are out, then the, sorry, once the Schwann cells are there, then the axons follow. So we see the importance of the presence of these Schwann cells to facilitate axonal regeneration. If we look at the mechanism of senescence in our laboratory, has been working with Sheila Stewart's laboratory and learned a lot about senescence from our collaboration with her lab. And we use some markers to look at the um, presence of uh, senescing cells, P16 and um, beta-gal. Also, Dan Hunter in our lab has been looking at the Schwann cells themselves. And what he's seen is that in the presence of these senescent markers, the Schwann cells look different. There's dispersion of the chromatin and breaking up of the chromatin you can see a normal Schwann cell on the left and then a, a Schwann cell that is uh, undergoing senescence hypothetically on the on the right. And again, we've got our six centimeter ANA model. And if we t look at various points along that uh, graft and look for um, the um, phenotype of these Schwann cells, we can see that we're getting a dispersion of the chromatin and these um, typical picture of the Schwann cells in the distal portions of those graphs. And if we co-label the um, uh, Schwann cell um, marker S100 with P16 marker, we can see that those are labeling uh, together in that distal uh, graft. This is looking at a, uh, a beta-gal and a P16 staining. And if you can look below, there's an ANA graft and that darker blue um, is a beta-gal staining. You can see how much bluer that is in the midsection of the ANA versus the uh, isograft. And again, the P16 fluorescent markers for uh, senescence and the fluorescent markers for um, the Schwann cells uh, are co-labeling. If we take senescent Schwann cells and inject them back into a conduit, and look um, at the nerve uh, regeneration in the conduit and then in the distal nerve, you can see there are some thinly myelinated axons in the mid-conduit, but distally not much regeneration. And if we compare that to a situation where we take normal Schwann cells and put them into a conduit, we have far uh, decreased um, regeneration and myelination. Similarly, if we co-culture senescent Schwann cells with neurons, we don't see the typical uh, elongation of the um, neuronal um, uh, processes as we would in a normal situation. They just stop when they meet those senescing Schwann cells. We've looked at a number of different ways of processing uh, nerves, and these are all available in the literature, and compared them to isograft. And what we've seen is that in all situations, the isograft is superior to the process graft or uh, the conduits. The clinical literature to date that has been published, so this is clinical use of the acellularized nerve allografts, uh, has uh, both clinical studies with mixed nerves, motor nerves, and sensory nerves, uh, lengths up to five sonometers, and the results there um, would say that they are successful um, for these types of reconstructions. My practice is to use ANAs for non-critical sensation as a small diameter substitute for a short uh, gap distance of about three centimeters, and also as an extender for painful neuromas. 
taking advantage of the fact that we've seen in the laboratory that if we extend the length of these ANAs for six centimeters, or certainly if we can get past four, then we're going to decrease the uh, regeneration, especially if we don't give the end of the nerve a, a distal nerve. So we've used them to enhance regeneration for small diameter short gaps and to slow regeneration when we're trying to treat um, neuromas. I spent years in our laboratory studied cadaver nerve uh, allografts and the uh, summation of a decade or two of work is that it is as good as an autograft. In fact, it can be slightly better if you can take advantage of the preloading with FK506, which enhances nerve regeneration. That FK506 has to be given before you do the, um, the surgery to get maximum effect. It doesn't have to be given before the injury, obviously, but when you go back in and freshen up that proximal nerve end, you are going to get better regeneration, we believe, if you have started the patient a couple of days before on FK506. We um, ABO match. We put the cadaver or donor-related uh, nerve in the refrigerator for four degrees or five degrees, just the refrigerator, with some UW solution and some antibiotics. And at seven days, we blunted the immunological response, but we still have viable Schwann cells to assist in uh, regeneration. So the advantage and, and disadvantages, the disadvantages is the immunosuppression. This acts as a temporary scaffold, so you don't need to keep the patient on immunosuppression forever. It's not vascularized. If you were to vascularize the nerve allograft, you would need to keep them on it indefinitely. And of course, there's risk to the patient for infections and tumors whenever they're immunosuppressed. In the small number of patients that I've done these cadaver grafts on, we haven't had that problem. You can use this, and we have used it successfully in controlling neuroma pain by suturing the painful nerve ends to a long cadaver allograft, which allows the nerve regeneration basically to peter out, fatigues the nerve. I think it also resets the spinal cord and brain um, with respect to the central changes that occur after an, a neurectomy. And you don't have to take a donor nerve from the patient. Patients with pain typically are going to have an increased likelihood of having pain at the uh, donor graft site. And finally, what about the autograft? There's a lot of effort, money, enthusiasm towards getting a substitute for a nerve autograft. And to date, the autographs substitutes are just used for short uh, gaps where really it's not too challenging to find an autograft unless all extremities have been amputated or multiple extremities have been amputated. But when we look at the uh, situation with respect to autographs and think about what are our results like with autographs, really an autograph should not be considered gold. It's anything but gold. And we've downgraded the status of autographs to bronze status from gold status. I think especially at the longer lengths, we're not sure of the exact limit point where we would see a abrupt fall off in function with an autograph, but I think it's probably around six centimeters or so. Experimentally, labs are looking at conduits to try to add to the conduit which, what it doesn't have, which is an extracellular matrix in cells. And with an acellularized nerve allograph, that's the little cartoon below, does have the extracellular matrix, but it doesn't have cells. And so uh, experimental studies will be done to add Schwann cells. And as well as not having the Schwann cells and the neural cells, it doesn't have the endothelial vascular tree as well. And it may be improved if, if we can do something to increase the vascularity. But no matter how you look at it, we're in these both conduits and acellularized nerve allografts, we're trying to reach the gold standard bronze. And I think we maybe need to um, keep our eye on the ball to realize that that autographed, especially as we increase the length, and you can see in that experimental study we did when we got just to six centimeters in a small diameter nerve in a rat, the regeneration was not that robust in our autograft. So that's a quick summary of our current thoughts. Hopefully as our laboratory continues to investigate this, we'll have even more up-to-date and different opinions. Thanks for your attention.